thanks for joining. Uh, what I'm going to do today in this video is review this, which is the software BISC Paramount series My T model um, telescope mount. I've had this for uh, almost 10 years, and um, I uh, think I'm a pretty good. Um, I have a pretty good feel for uh, for the mount and uh, how it behaves and uh, and good times and bad. Um, the the punchline here is if you're in the um, market for a mid range mount uh, mount. Uh, that can handle 30 to 60 pounds of payload capacity. This is really a, an outstanding um, alternative. And um, it's more expensive than some alternatives, uh, and it's the same price as others in their peer group. Um, like I said, I've had this for about 10 years, and uh, my experience with the cheap, the less expensive equipment is over a period of that time, it um, tends to uh, have failures and maintenance problems that are relatively difficult to uh, recover from. Whereas this thing uh, is just bulletproof. Um, if you have a failure, you can get it fixed. If you have maintenance, you can do maintenance. If there's a system upgrade like there is right now, the electronics are being upgraded from the 5000 series of the 6000 series, you can upgrade the electronics. Um, this uh, under dovetail mount um, uh, electronics package can be replaced. Um, so uh, on balance, um, it, there's a, a, a higher initial um, capital cost, but um, you really can consider this as something that's gonna last 20 plus years. Even if you have problems with it, the problems can be fixed. Now, that having been said, uh, I'm going to characterize the, the rest of my comments into, into two categories, which are um, uh, serial defect and nice to know things. Geez, I wish I would have known that. So, um, I mean, I like this so much that they, they came out with the new electronics package, the, the 6,000 from the 5,000, which this one is. And there's a new version that is on access encoders for this mighty team out. And I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I'll get one of those and just keep this and put some else on. Uh, um, so like, this is really uh, take, take my serial defect comments in the, um, in, in the, in the, in the way that they're intended. The other thing that's really nice about this company is they really do aftermarket um, uh, service very well. So there's forums, you get a uh, username and password, you put your problem on the forum, someone's back to you in the next day. Um, if that requires further follow-up, further follow-up ensues, um, you know, they really take take it serious. If you have a problem with your mount and you need to get something fixed, they are happy to uh, work with you to get the spare parts. Uh, and generally, I find that the documentation on this equipment is really quite complete. Now, one of my nice to know is I'm going to jump ahead and put it right now is regarding documentation. Um, there's an awful lot of documentation that does not come with the user's manual. And so on the software BISC website under support, there's a documentation page. And I really recommend as soon as you buy this thing, or if you have one now, go into that web page and just downloading the 20 documents that you might have any interest in because there's all sorts of useful stuff there. I'm like, geez, I wish I could know. And it's not that they didn't tell me it's in the documentation page. It just didn't leap out at you in the tech, in the tech, in the uh, user's manual. Um, so uh, what's the serial defect? The serial defect is on this um, uh, control system, the MS, the MKS 5000. 
uh, there is a single point of failure. That's the largest complaint the company has on this mount. And it is that it uses a USB um, mini uh, cape uh, fitting uh, to plug into the card. And there's no other way to get into the card. You have to go in through that fitting. Um, and, um, uh, and that fitting fails from time to time. I think it fails for a couple of reasons. This, I've had it fail twice and I fixed it twice. And I think I got a pretty good idea why it fails. So the first failure mechanism is it's just not sailor proof. What do I mean by that? I mean, you've got this equipment, it's nighttime, it's cold. You've got cables, people are tripping over cables. Boom, you trip over this cable and it rips the, uh, uh, rips, rips the USB um, female right off the circuit board. But it's not just that. So there's a very nicely machined plate that goes over this and it's two screws where you, uns you unscrew it and take the plate off. Well, the plate's a couple millimeters thick and the plate doesn't mate to the USB mini a female. They float. One's here on the PCB and this is not perfectly aligned. And even if it was, it wouldn't stay perfectly aligned over a long period of time. So what happens is, regardless of how careful you are, you go look for that USB mini, you're going through a couple millimeters of plate and you, you have to juggle the female to have the two mate. And um, that causes uh, forces on the PCB and um, it causes the, over time, this uh, um, USB uh, a plug to get separated from the um, circuit board. Um, now, the first time this happened to me, I got the technical document on how to replace this thing, and I pulled it out, and I took the card off the uh, off the mounting. The card the card comes mounted to a dovetail plate. And the dovetail plate is very nice. I mean, it's rock solid. It's mounted to that plate. Unscrew the little dovetail. Unscrew the little screws. Pull out the dovetail plate. Very easy. I could sit here while I'm doing this and not even be looking at it and do it for you. Um, then there's eight or so plugs, cables that land on the uh, printed circuit board. They pop right off. Now you have the dovetail plate and the, the printed circuit board. So you can unscrew the printed, printed circuit board from the dovetail plate. Uh, I actually don't recommend doing this. This one going over all this detail, um, and send it off to, and, and say, you know, software biz on another one of these, and eight hundred dollars later, you'll get another one. Now, problem: they don't service this uh, five thousand system anymore, so you actually won't get another one, even if you want to spend the eight hundred dollars. I suggest you shouldn't spend the eight hundred dollars anyway. Because you can go down to your local electronics repair store, bring the little USB plug that fell off, bring the printed circuit board. You don't have to take it off the dub plate. In fact, I recommend you don't because it provides a nice sturdy way to carry the printed circuit board without it getting damaged. And 50 hours later, the guy soldered the thing back on. You come back and you're back in service. Now, I'm so worried about this that I actually went through the trouble of you know take a little electronics clay grade sealant and making sure that this USB plug wasn't coming off again. Um I think it's a good move on my part. Then I got a little dongle here. So now I don't even go into this USB mini on the, the mount anymore. I just plug into this dongle. So I'm not putting any stress on, on this thing. And when I put this in the field, I put a little jerk stop thing on this. So I know that I'm not going to stress this thing out. 
And the other thing I did was I took a little electronics grade electronics glue and glued the male into the female. So I don't expect to ever have a problem again. And if I did, I'd take a heat gun and sweat the glue off and take the thing back to the electronics guy and I'd fix it again. So, and it would have cost me my time and $50, which uh, is a big improvement on $800. So the problem you have now, and the one reason why I'm doing this video and this review, so people are in the same circumstance, I know there are because they see the questions on the uh, forum. Um, is if your 5,000 circuit board fails, you can't go get a replacement. They're out of, they're out of stock and they don't make them anymore. I mean, they literally don't make them anymore. So their original vendor doesn't make them anymore. And so uh, the MS6000 looks to me like a huge improvement. It really solves many, but not all, but many, most of these issues. Problem. We can't buy the upgrade kit yet. So if you've got one of these 5000s and you have this failure, you're actually not out of luck. You do have to take things into your own hands and go do what I just described and get it fixed. So when the BISC people talk about what complaints they get for this mount, they're like, hey, we get this complaint on this USB port. And then there's the next. There's a huge gap down. And the next thing they get is complaints for the relative of this exact same problem which is where the power cord mounts into this mount is 48 volts. So uh, you've got a unique kind of plug, male, female, you got a unique um, power supply and you got to get the power supply from a 120 to 48 volt um, converter into the mount. And you run into all the sailor proof issues again. So, you know, trip over the cord, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, they do make a Ego battery um, device. So you can power this off an of Ego battery. Um, I did that for a long time until my Ego battery putzed out. And then, I, I that, that the ego this device it's really got one right behind me has no moving parts. Mine doesn't work anymore. I have no idea why I've gotten from that, but does doesn't matter. The bottom line is the second pro, the second most common problem is this power plug. And I think what I do is I take the the power plug and I make sure there's plenty of slack, and then I take whatever cables are going to and from this mount, and I go to the uh, the mount that it sits on, and I either duct tape or Velcro this to that leg. And so if someone does trip over the cable, they're just going to fall on their face, and they're not going to rip my cord out of my mount. Much preferable outcome for me. So that's kind of the two... That's the serial defect, and then that's kind of the other nuisance item. Now, th the rest of what I have is not a complaint at all. It's just kind of, geez, I wish I would have known that. The first thing I wish I would have known is this thing has, and this is no order, so it's not really the first thing. It's just the one I'm going to talk about. The first thing I'm going to, that I'm going to talk to you about is there's no GPS on here. Now, I can... It, but if I go like go on Google Maps or whatever and I pick up the GPS, I got to, you know, maybe you have a couple acres there. So you really don't know. So you take that item and you fill in all the decimal points and goes into the system that the Sky X, which is the compatible software to this. I think, oh, I put in like seven digits or eight digits. Like it knows exactly where I am. Well, you don't know where on that couple acres they pulled that. Google ID card out. So, no, you actually don't know where you are. You know kind of about where you are. You know the GPS coordinates for your road or your city, maybe the front of your driveway. But 
unless your mound is at the front of your driveway, you're off. Now, does that matter? No, not if you're using this thing for optical purposes or you you know you, you're shooting a planet. But if you're shooting something involved, no, it matters. It actually matters, and it certainly matters when you're doing a 300 point T point model. So easy solution. They sell apps. You can put them on your phone. I have one on my phone and right where my tripod is, I take the GPS from that exact spot and I make sure that um, I'm, I'm, I'm accurate. Now, in reality, what I do isn't any of that. I've got one, I've got one of these, the Sky Fusions computers over here and it has a GPS and it, you know, is what I use to control this thing. So problem solved. That cost me a couple of scratchy heads. I'll tell you, figuring that one out. Now, you can see here, I use a pole master. Um, of course, the pole master uses our good friend, the UPC Mini 2 as well. And you'll notice that in the olden days, they didn't have this kind of bulletproof screw-in design. Now they do. So I think they probably had a problem with their USB minis too. Now, instead of pulling my USB mini out and back, you know, every time I use the pull master, I just had the cable affixed by Velcro to the side of the mount. And I don't know, I guess that's an asymmetric weight on one side of the mount, but it doesn't weigh that much. And so every night when I go do this, I just un-Velcro it and then I Velcro it back and I, I don't upset this USB mini on my pull master. Um, now, I know you do not need to use a pole master. You can polar align eight other different ways, blah, blah, blah. I get it. I know how to do alternative methods. I love getting my mount level. I watched a video the other day. You don't need your mount level. I'm looking at it. I'm like, yes, but you got, you realize your three tripod legs are in the exact right spot. So like maybe a normal person doesn't at their mount level. I level my uh, tripod. I make sure it's level in the plane. So, and um, I uh, put the one leg pointing towards the celestial pole. I take my iPad and I put one of those, uh, you know, the Sky HD or any program that has Polaris in it and I take my iPad and I make it flush to this and make sure I'm pointed towards Polaris. So that gets me, my, that gets me pointed more or less to Polaris. And the pole master gets me polar aligned. When I go out um, one night to the next, I don't even make an adjustment. I just, I, you know, I spend the five minutes because it's part of my routine and whatever. But um, when I go to, a, when I take, take everything down and I'm putting it back up again, I, it's my house. I have those, the foot marks marked. But um, so I, you know, I, I actually don't need to use the iPad. And then, you know, this is more or less going to have Polaris in it when I first turn the thing on because um, unless I've been, someplace where I made big adjustments. So, which does happen. And so, um, uh, if you are someplace it's new or you made an adjustment, you, you put the iPad up, you see Polaris, you get yourself right, left aligned and um, turn on the pole master and boom, you're polar aligned. It took you 10 minutes instead of three. Um, So I think it I think it it does it does matter. I know you can do it another way. Man, it's nice getting this thing fired up, taking being level and not being polar line, taking it out of the equation. Uh, they sell a aftermarket software BIS does a uh, fitting, so you can just plop your pull master right on. Um, in reality, it's simple enough. You can make one yourself. I mount this, I have a mighty uh, portable pier. Um, 
it's nice, it's light, it's portable, it has a beautiful case. You can go put it in its case, it travels well. Um, it's not really that robust if you care if you've got a big payload on this thing. So I I, I really mount this to a um, pretty damn sturdy tripod that's like I don't know, weighs a hundred pounds. So um, if I was going someplace and I was just going to go set up casually, no, I'd take my mighty T mount. Away you go. Now, how did I? How did I? How do I make this base plate to another vendor's tripod? I take the base plate, take the tripod plate off the tripod, I take it to a machine shop, and I have them drill the holes in the right spot. 60 bucks later, I'm done. What I don't do is spend hundreds of dollars on some sort of adapter system that may or may not work anyway. So, um, so one thing, if you're going to do this for years and years and years, you should, you know, you're going to have to get friendly with an electronics repair guy and a machine shop guy. I mean, I talk to that guy like twice a year. I've got some astronomy thing I need, you know, drilled out or, you know, the threads aren't right or, you know, what, whatever. It's, it's endless. Um, so um, that's my solution for that. Now, um moisture control like whoever designed this like lives in a desert or something like they they weren't really thinking about oh i might put this in the northeast by the seashore um and so um i have taken a stab at at moisture control so i took care of the easy ones which i took that uh um uh, electronics stuffing tube material. We used to call it monkey shit in the Navy. I'm, I don't know what they call it now, but that's what I got in here. And so I don't have condensation leaking down into my electronics box. Um, I thought about coating the electronics circuit board with either, um, you know, frankly, this would do it or um, people say on the internet, you can use nail polish remover, coat per printed circuit board. Uh, I'd just rather use electronics grade silicone, but whatever. Um, but I didn't. I didn't really do that. I, I I did use this to kind of buttress up a few places of of interest, make sure that everything was firm and steady. Um, uh, you know, a, another thing here is, is, is this little aux power cable, it doesn't really go to anything. It goes from here to here. So I think that's great. Actually, I actually have a fitting that goes into this so I can take a normal 12 volt plug and plug it in here and have it come out here to another dongle. And then I got 12 volts that I, so I can put 20 amps of 12 volts without having to go putting cables through the mouse. So I actually think this this little thing's handy. This this cover, I don't even put it on. I leave it off. And when I put the, the mount away, and I think it might get rained on, I've got a nice cover for that. But I'll just I put a little desk bag in there and seal it up. Um home versus park. This is kind of funny. Like I think that software bisque i'm fully supportive of the way they do this and i know that they have an alternative strategy for the um, 6000 controls instead of the 5000 but they have this um setup where you turn the mount on you have to home the mount the mount needs to go to home well where is home home is zero declination at two hour angle to me it's off to the south takes my telescope and points it right at my neighbor's second floor windows. Um, it just is where it is. It's, a, it's just some random spot in the sky. This thing goes over there. I really can't do much from there. So I just drive, frankly, I set the park position to the celestial pole. When I put it in park, the mount goes back to park, and I start my evening from there. 
the reason why setting the home position very far away from the celestial pole is actually quite clever and good. Because the mount can go there, the mount knows where it is, the mount knows where that is, it knows where it is, and it knows where that is on the sky. And so it kind of like all is well in the world for a moment in time. So when you're moving, you're you're going on a bridge from somewhere. The problem with having the celestial north pole as a point of reference for the control system. I'm not talking about polar alignment. That's you know the the nice thing about having a celestial pole. So we can align to the celestial pole, and then our right ascension just can do a 360 degrees around the sky. So it's 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 a wonderful place to orient your mount for viewing the rest of the sky. It's a horrible place to have as a reference point for a home position because there's not a unique description, a unique, a unique identifier of its position. There's thousands, tens of thousands of deck and RA combinations that go to the celestial pole because, like, it, you know, you could, you know, you're just, you're just spinning around the thing. Whereas, Zero declination to our angle is a point that is uniquely described by one declination and RA um, a coordinate, which is you know what the control system needs. So we have a coordinate system that's unique to this spot in the world, which was we previously described. We're going to make sure we know where that spot is, and so we know where this coordinate system has a start from. And um, uh, 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 we and the coordinate system is the um, RA in the deck. <clears throat> um, the RA being the right ascension, moving like this, and the deck being the rotation in the other plane. So we have two planes of motion in a three-dimensional space, and um, that can pretty much get you to in spot because we're actually going to a two-dimensional sphere, right? We're going to the surface of the sphere. So the third element of the three dimensions is infinity because we're going to a star that's infinity away. Um, so that's my comments on Homan Park. Um, my comments on the worm gear. When I bought this, I use a very heavy load on this. I weighed it; it's fifty nine pounds. The rate of capacity this is fifty pounds. It handles my fifty nine pounds with no problem. Um, I you know I don't know the guys. Sorry, software biz people. Um, I I, I like I'm very happy. Uh, with this thing in 59 pounds. Um, the problem is the worm gears. The worm gears come out of the factory with the setting, and the setting for the Mighty T does not contemplate you swinging around 59 pounds. It comes with the factory setting, and the factory guys set it for, you know, a reasonable number of weight, of payload capacity. And so there's a cap right here, this cap. Uh, there was a, another uh, YouTube video about this exact mount, and the guy's like, oh, I struggled for six months when I changed my payload from one, um, uh, tele one optical tube to another optical tube. And I'm like, yeah, one was a lot heavier, so you needed to change this setting. Now, I don't know if they mentioned this in the user's manual. Like, it didn't make a big impression on my memory because I didn't remember it. However, there is a wonderful document that's on this document page that if you bought this mount, you went to that document page and you downloaded the 20 things that were relevant to you and you're at least brief through them, you at least know there was one about this very issue. So you pop this little cover off and sure enough, there's a, 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 a plate and the plate has two set screws and there's a spray. And that's the 
that's the setting of how much pressure gets applied to the worm gears um, to the, uh, the rotating gears. So this here, this box right here is a motor in it and the motor drives the worm gear, you know, which is just a tube, you know, it's a, it goes round and round and it goes round in one direction and round in another direction and it's rotating the permanent teeth that are on the plane that's rotating. That's what causes the mouth to rotate. So you have two of these, the right ascension, motors, worm gear, rotating gear set. And the exact same, the parts are the same part number. Right here for the deck, the declination. Now, I'm not a mountain design guy, but my, I suspect that 80% of the load is seen by the um, right ascension worm gear and gear. Just kind of park that thought for a minute. So this setting, if you're carrying a heavy load, you got to adjust this setting. If you're carrying a light load, you can back off on a little bit, presumably, or just use the factory setting. There's a procedure on how to do it. It's a very easy procedure. It took me I don't know, minutes, you know, it took me longer to read the procedure than it did to do it. This access point gives you perfect access to it. You don't have to take a bunch of stuff apart. There's no, you know, key wrenches or it just, it just comes right out and boom, you're done. So I actually did not have six months of struggle. I had struggle until I figured it out. And that, you know, it took me like three minutes after that. Now, I had a failure here. Well, I thought it was a failure. In retrospect, I just bought a spare part, an $800 spare part. Um, so my mount worked fine, well, you know, a year or two years, whatever. And then all of a sudden it started slipping. What I should have done was adjust the screws. I didn't do that. I got myself the new worm gear. I took the worm gear and I replaced it. And again, there's a procedure. It's like this thing really comes out very easily. The other one goes in very easily. And, you know, there's, I mean, I don't think it took me a half hour. Uh, I mean, it might have taken me a half hour to read the procedure. But, you know, once I took a wrench out, I don't think I spent more than a half hour on it. Um, I enjoyed doing it. I learned more about how this thing is built and operated and I kind of like learning that anyway and I'm fine. But in reality, all I need to do is to change the set screws. Now, if you did have a worm gear that was starting to wear, I don't even know how you can do that to be honest with you because this thing's seen a lot of um, use and I got a big old heavy load on it and, and I took this thing out and it had no wear on it. I'm like, that's odd, this thing slipped and I'm not seeing any wear on these teeth. No, as the setting was wrong. But anyway, if I did take it apart or I did see where, I wouldn't buy a new one either. I'd just swap it out with the deck. This thing sees no load. So now I got a spare up in my deck. I got a spare in my basement that I could use again because now I know how to set it up. And I got this thing working just fine. So, you know, I think I'm done for 50 years on this worm gear thing and it will not never cost me another penny. It was an $800 lesson, though. Um, through the mount cables. Okay. This cable here to go, that goes to this goes through here. Through here. Through here. And then down into the um, electronic compartment here where the card is. No problem. There's plenty of room for this stuff. In fact, if you take this off, which is the um, counterweight uh, mounting bracket, so the counterweight goes into this hole right here, but th this thing pops right off. If you want to run something through the mount, pop this off. Take a string. Pull the string through with one of those gripper pull things. 
bring this thing here, take the gripper, put it through here, pull the string out here, take the string, tie it to whatever you want to put to the mount, like a USB cable or a power cable, or whatever. Like I said, you don't even really need to use a power cable. All you really need to do is get these two, four pin to whatever conversion you, you want and use the cable that's already there. That's a very good idea, by the way. Um, but, you know, then you tie the little messenger wire you, string. You got, so now you got the string here, you got the string here, tie it to with the cable, and then you just go pull it through. What you're not going to be able to do is to take the little um, uh, gripper thing and run it, the snake and run it through here, come out here and grip on something and pull it all the way through. There's way too much interference on the stuff that's already there for that to work. But uh, so, you, you know, if you want something to go through this mount, I mean, you're just going to have to say it's going to take me an hour because I'm going to have to take this off and I'm going to put it back on. I got to do all this. Just like an hour is going to go away, but easy to do. I mean, there's no rocket science involved in, in, in all this um, whatsoever. Um, okay. There's a procedure. There's a YouTube video on changing the lubricant that's in these gears. I've never done it, but you know what? I'm going to. Um, I don't know why I'm going to. I don't think I need to. I mean, think about the load on that lubricant as opposed to like a bicycle hub or any automotive application or any marine application. You know, these things see that, that lubricant seeing you know, thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands of revolutions before you have to worry about replacing the lubricant. I mean, this thing's seeing you know, 200 revolutions a week or not even that. I mean, so it's a very low load application for the lubricant. Um, when I changed this mount out, I did go into the BIS control system, into the utilities, and I did exercise the mount because I did want the lubricant to get all over the, um, all, all over everything's there. But Watching the YouTube video of replacing the lubricant makes me under and having taken this apart and seen how it all, all, all lies in there and I'm like, yeah, this is going to take me very long anyway. I actually bought the lubricant. So it's I'm going into winter, which I'm going to use all this all winter long when I got nice, clear, beautiful, hopefully skies. It's December now. It's not beautiful at all. In fact, it's really horrible. But thinking ahead to when I have nice, clear winter skies. Um, but, you know, uh, April showers, I'm gonna bring this all inside and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean up, uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna clean up everything and change the oil just because I know how. Um, I think I talked about the Mighty T mount. I think I talked about the fact that or the tripod, I think it talked about the path that it worked, but don't use it with a big heavy load other than casually. Um, I mean, I like it. It's just, you know, don't be slinging a pay payload more than 30 pounds with that mighty mountain. Expect things to go well. Um, one of the things I like about this uh, mount is the compatibility with the other stuff the software BIS company sells, mainly the SkyX. The SkyX is a wonderful computer program. I'm running it right here. Now, this is my Mac, and I'm, I'm live via Wi-Fi to my Fusion which is also on. So I can click a button and home this mount. And it's going to move right in front of you. I use um, a different computer, a Windows computer, because if you do astronomy, you know that the it's really hard to get away from Windows. Um, 
uh, as much as I hate windows and I hate windows. Um, and I'm going to do another video on the sky. X. I'm going to do another video on the fusion. I'm glad the fusions Linux. So, so good, good move there. Cause who wants this windows stuff and, and, you know, crashing in your uh, on mount computer, not me. Um, but the fact that this is compatible to the fusion, which I highly recommend using a on mount computer, whether you go get, uh, the Intel sells this nook. Um, there's some uh, other non Intel brands that are quite, quite good and, and uh, lots of uh, YouTube videos on how to set them up. Um, there's a high end Windows model made by uh, some Italians. They call it the Eagle. Like, I don't think they have Eagles in Italy, do they? But whatever, they call it the Eagle. Um, and uh, then this Fusion, which is Linux based. And I'm like, oh, you know, like I'm going to have this Linux based thing and I'm going to have to put a little Windows mini computer on, you know, on top of that to run my focuser, what, you know, whatever, you know, is completely incompatible to uh, any other operating system. Well, no, they, 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 they were ahead of me here and, and uh, solved the integration problem. Thank you. Um, so, it's very clear when I have an interface with the software BIS company people that they actually are astronomers themselves and use this equipment, and you can tell. Um, and like I said, you do this for 10 years, like you're just going to have things go wrong, and you're going to have questions, and things aren't going to go right, and you're going to need to have some support. And man, it's really, really helpful to have the support be right here in America where, where they can do a, a wonderful job of uh, knowing what your problems are. They've all seen it before. I feel sorry for some of these guys because you, you ask a question like, well, the other 452 times I asked her the exact same question, this is what I said. I feel a little sorry for them when that, when that happens. It happens all the time. Uh, but, you know, you get all that knowledge just comes right at you. And uh, it's very helpful. So. Because the one thing about astronomy is for sure is it this doesn't work right out of the box, like not in my experience. Um, so you you know you do need a little help, and so you know a lot of your questions are stupid questions, and you know nothing wrong with that. Um, so I like the fact that the service is good, that it integrates well with these other products. Now, even the Sky X, you can say, well, that's over to kill it. Well, they make the, 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 the light version. Um, and um, I don't use it, but I can see why you'd use it. You put it, you can get it right on your um, iPad probably. I mean, I know, in fact, you can, because I use the iPad to control my Fusion and the Fusion has the, um, the light version on it and it's the screen size is set up so it is uh, can fit the ipad screen dimensions perfectly that's my point these guys have thought through all this stuff and like does everything always work perfectly absolutely not does everything always work perfectly in astronomy always perfectly absolutely not so you got you got a team in your in your corner that's willing to help you out. And that is worth, I mean, it's, 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 it's really invaluable. Um, so, oh my God, I talked to 44 minutes, like no one's gonna listen to even a third of that. So that's my review on, on the, the Mighty. Um, I'm gonna do another review on the Sky X. I'm gonna do another review on the, the Fusion. I'm going to do a review on my uh, plane wave uh, 12 and a half inch, which is what I put on this thing. It's, it looks kind of odd, you know, it's really huge. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a review of my star adventure, which is what, if you're getting into this, you shouldn't be buying this mount or any other mid-sized mount. You should be buying something small, one of the best, nice, easiest things small, or these little sky tracker things. They work really nicely. You take them on vacation. That's what I'm doing. And uh, 
you know, I, I, I really, I really like it. It's not, it's not this, um, but it is very fun and rewarding and interesting. And it's a good way to learn astronomy. It's a good way to learn the sky, where things are, and how to take pictures and process pictures and, you know, point something at something and find, find things and whatnot. Um, and then I'm going to do another video or two on how do you make all this crap work? Because let me help you out. It is not simple. And all the videos that I've seen on this subject baby stepped me in the right direction, perhaps. I got books up here in my bookshelf, some of which were very helpful. But man, no one really shows you how to set something up and achieve focus for the very first time with the equipment that's brand new. And that ain't, that ain't easy. And um, it's getting a little easier with, with all this focusing software, but I mean, it, it's, it's hard to get something even within the bandwidth of, 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 of the focus travel if you're not careful. So um, uh, that, like I thought this video would be like 15 minutes. I was just gonna get on here and say how much I love this thing. But um, that's my experience with the, the Mighty T. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I promise to keep the other videos like a lot, lot, lot shorter. Thank you for watching. <laughs>